So we're on the takeoff roll now. We're just uh, just passing 100 knots, and at the moment everything is fine. Veteran 737 pilot Chris Brady is about to take me on a terrifying flight. Approaching the uh, the rotate speed. There we go. So we're just easing back on the uh, on the elevators by moving the stick back, and you see the aircraft becomes airborne. In this simulator, we're replicating the 12 minutes pilots on board the Indonesian Line Air Flight 610 experienced before crashing into the sea in October last year. Now the flaps have retracted, this is the point at which the MCAS would, uh, would come alive. Unbeknown to pilots on this brand new aircraft, the Boeing 737 MAX, a computer flight control system called MCAS, hidden in the plane, suddenly activates. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000. I'm stopping there because that's already Whoa. looking very uncomfortable. Whoa. And I'm going to try and pull back out of that. I'm going to have to use trim to help me out of it. MCAS has the ability to automatically and repeatedly take control of the plane. And on this line air flight, it did just that. So and you can see how dramatic that was. That's happening irrespective of anything you're trying to do. That, that's, yes. that's just happened whether you liked it or not. Yes. MCAS had malfunctioned and allowed the pilots just five second intervals to regain control. So I now think the problem's gone. I think the problem's solved. But what we don't know is behind the scenes, in the black boxes, they're counting to five. And as soon as they count to reach five, it happens again. Back down we go again. Into misbehaving. And you look out the window and, oh my god, you're, you're in the dive again. It's got a mind of its own. Its logic is programmed 10 seconds on, five seconds off. And we don't know that because we, as the, we of the pilots have never been told. It was never in our manuals. Again and again, Chris Brady fights the rogue MCAS system, but it's a losing battle. It will start to trim down, so let's go in two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you can see that we're now in a very, very steep dive. I'm not a pilot, but uh, that makes me almost sick to think about her. I mean, me too. Me too. It's such a horrible situation to be in. It's unimaginable. Lost contact with air traffic control. At 6:32 a.m. local time on October 29th last year, Line Air 610 crashes at extraordinary speed. The friends of those on board appeared helpless and inconsolable. Killing all 189 men, women and children on board. And we learned that there was a system on the aircraft which we had no knowledge of. It wasn't in our books. It, we hadn't been trained to it. It was absolute blindfold in a dark forest for us. But five months later, despite Boeing's assurances its new jet was safe, another 737 MAX crashes into the mountains of Ethiopia, its pilots fighting to the death to take control. And this voice said, is this Susan Riffle? And I said, yes. And they said, are you alone? And so I just knew. And I just said, both our boys. And he said, I'm really sorry. 346 lives and the reputation of Boeing, the world's largest aircraft company, lay scattered in the waters of Indonesia and in the soil of Ethiopia. The last six minutes of their life has had to be horrific. It's um, just... Um, that, that'll haunt me for the rest of my life. My life now? Mm. <laughs> it's taken away from me.
The 737 MAX was Boeing's most successful aircraft ever. Now the entire fleet is grounded, with many questioning its future. Airlines around the world had already ordered 5,000 of Boeing's new 737 MAX. But with two jets down, the company was now faced with the unthinkable. Did the new star of their fleet have a serious design flaw? This is now one of aviation's greatest scandals and the subject of two criminal investigations. Pilots around the world are furious. 350 people died as a result of this. What else has got through? You know, what else could be, could be on board that we haven't seen yet? And it's relentless. It's powerful. It was a monster in a cage. Design engineers are asking, how did this happen? When you go home at night and you put your head on the pillow, you ask yourself, what did I miss? How was it that an aircraft could seemingly have a mind of its own? All of a sudden, the aircraft's nose went down to 40 degrees. Now, 40 degrees is terrifyingly steep. This is literally kamikaze stuff. Now, whistleblowers are talking. We were under pressure to minimize changes, to cut costs, and to get it done quickly. And Boeing is being asked, was there a flaw in the system? It was all triggered by this intense competition. Because it put profits before people. Boeing was always playing catch up. Coming up, the hidden fault. That pilots were saying, what's going on here? And a company denying responsibility. It's clear that after that crash, Boeing's immediate impulse was to suggest that it was pilot error. That's next on 60 Minutes. Boeing 737 has been the most successful passenger aircraft of all time. Since it first flew in 1967, over 10,000 have been made, revamped multiple times. But by 2011, Boeing decided it was time to design something new. That was until its competitor Airbus released their NEO, an advanced version of its A320. Boeing was always playing catch up. Seattle Times aviation reporter Dominic Gates has long covered the hometown the giant Boeing. I mean, a lot of our readers work at Boeing. And remembers the company's alarm when Airbus launched its ultra modern Neo. In July of 2011, Boeing executives learned that American Airlines was about to order 200. A320 NEOs, this new re-engined plane. And there was total panic here in Seattle. Almost overnight, Boeing found itself in a dogfight with its greatest competitor, Airbus. So it made a decision. Instead of starting from scratch and developing a brand new plane, Boeing decided to take one more roll of the dice with the 737. They didn't have a Max, they didn't have a plane, but on the spot, they said, okay, we'll re-engine the 737 if you give us half that order. And Americans said yes. We were under pressure to minimize any changes to cut costs and to get it done quickly. In my view, Boeing was making decisions on the basis of share price. These claims are from a Boeing insider who can't be identified and is now an FBI informant in a criminal investigation into the company. Your most profitable single-aisle aircraft ever. He was involved in the design and development of the 737 MAX and says that part of the sales pitch to prospective buyers was that this new aircraft wouldn't require costly retraining of pilots. The main requirement driving the design of the MAX was that there could be no changes that would require flight simulator training by pilots. We could have really upgraded that aircraft, but the company's mandate about no extra training stopped us. Upgrading the old 737 to keep up with its newer Airbus rival was easier said than done. Its new fuel-efficient engines were too big to fit beneath its 53-year-old body. 
They moved the engines forward and up. But Boeing then discovered that caused a serious problem in flight. A lift effect that forced the plane's nose up, risking a stall. And stalling can literally make an aircraft fall from the sky. Boeing knew the engine design and placement would make the aircraft pitch up, with an increased risk of stalling, especially at low speed. But we were too close to certification to change the design. So Boeing came up with a fix, a computer program called MCAS that would automatically force the plane's nose down that could be activated by just one sensor. The decision was made to add a software program to the flight control system, MCAS. But MCAS was not heavily reviewed. We didn't really understand its failure modes. The MAX became a runaway success. Boeing believed the MCAS system would automatically deal with any stall issues and that the plane would handle just the same as the older version. And that meant to fly the new plane, pilots only needed to upgrade by completing a course on an iPad. This was the upgrade, was it? Yes, when we first received the MAX, we were provided a 56-minute uh, iPad course, which we could uh, accomplish anywhere at home or in a Starbucks. Um, Dennis and, uh, Tager is a veteran pilot for American Airlines and spokesman for the American the Pilots but, Union. Uh, it's pretty much the same, right? So go ahead and fly it. We accepted that at their, at their word. But, but nowhere the in the iPad course or the pilot's flight gear. manual so, uh, flight did Boeing ever mention the, the MCAS anti-stall system. Uh, no mention of MCAS? Not one. No, in in not any one. of those? Not a mention of it. It's not on our books. It's not on our lesson plan. American Airlines didn't even know about it. Boeing's error in not telling pilots about the existence of the MCAS system would soon have catastrophic consequences. The crash of Lion Air Flight 610 off the Indonesian coast killed all 189 on board. The flight path of this brand new 737 MAX showed dramatic changes in altitude until its final high-speed death dive into the sea. It's clear that after that crash, Boeing's immediate impulse was to suggest that it was pilot error. And I think because of legal liability, Boeing's very, very reluctant to say anything that indicates there's something wrong with our plane until it became very clear that, in fact, there was something wrong with the plane. How quickly did you realise that this was an aircraft problem that we were looking at? I think pretty much right away, as soon as we saw the airplane had dove down straight into the water, um, that, that indicated there's something wrong with the airplane. Peter Lemmy is a former Boeing engineer, an aviation expert who is now cooperating with a US Justice Department investigation into Boeing. He reviewed Lion Air's flight data recording. As an aviation engineer, I imagine that when you look at that, your heart sinks. Seeing, seeing the pilot fighting an aircraft system is very difficult to watch. That pilots were saying, what's going on here? I'm having to uh, deal with the system, which I didn't know about. It has been grounded. In London, aviation stay. expert David and Learmount so from the International Flight Global yeah, Group I think they had a lot of confidence in their own system. also but suspected the cause of the crash was not pilot error. I think one of the smoke screens is that Indonesia doesn't have a brilliant safety record. It really doesn't. And so you have a crash in Indonesia and some people in the industry will say, what do you expect? Days after the Lion Air crash, Boeing finally revealed the existence of their new MCAS flight control system. Pilots around the world were shocked. We called our safety experts and said, where is this in the book? And they said, it's not. And I said, well, does, does our airline, American, have it? No. And we learned later that no one across the globe had it in their books. It's unacceptable. This is an unforgiving profession that counts very heavily on the pilot's knowledge, background, and training. 
and there are lives depending on that. Why on earth didn't Boeing name this system in the Flight Crew Operations Manual? What is the analogy for those of us who don't fly planes of what it must have been like to learn of something brand new in your cockpit? Well, it's as if you buy a new car and you're driving along and, and suddenly it veers off and careens into a wall and you didn't do anything and you ask the dealer, what, what was going on there? And, oh, well, it was a system. What system? Uh, an auto drive system. An auto drive system? Yeah, when it's raining and your window's half open, it just automatically tries to find a garage and it just turns right to the nearest one. Well, it turned into a wall and I didn't know about it. That's what it's like. That's what it felt like. Betrayal, shock. How in the world could you do that? I don't think I want to buy another car from you. Representing thousands of American pilots, Dennis Tager met with Boeing executives, asking why pilots hadn't been told about MCAS. And their response was they didn't want to inundate the pilot with extra information that they didn't think was necessary to fly the aircraft. They thought they would overload you with information yeah, they, if you yeah. knew about this. Yes, and so our response was, try us. We're pretty good at information. But it sent a very strong signal to us that somewhere in there the philosophy had been tainted and poisoned. It, it was just illogical. Boeing claimed that any malfunction of the MCAS system could have always been dealt with if pilots followed a safety checklist. Trouble is, pilots didn't know what they were dealing with. It was a monster in a cage, and when it came out when it wasn't supposed to, it had no boundaries, and the pilot was left, after all of those distractions, uh, left to just simply refer to a very common checklist, give me a break. That's not how it really happens in a cockpit. Boeing knew a week after the Lion Air crash there was something wrong with that system. But then they thought they'd fixed it. And they thought they'd fixed it. And they said, there's a way of handling it. Maybe you, we didn't tell you about this before. You didn't know the system was on the airplane. But now you know. And if this happens again, you do this. So, yes, they knew the problem. And they thought they had a solution. For five months, Boeing kept cranking out the Maxes and assured the aviation industry that the MCAS software installed in the 737 MAX was safe. On March 10th this year, that assurance would be proved tragically wrong. Coming up... Five, four, three, two, one... Six minutes of terror. There would have been calamitous noise on the flight deck. So this is all happening in seconds, and then comes the chainsaw. And a family's unimaginable torment. That'll haunt me for the rest of my life. That's next on 60 Minutes. As brothers, they were chalk and cheese. 26-year-old Melvin Riffle was the life of the party, who loved outdoor sports. Bennett was three years younger and the quieter one, who preferred the solitude of nature. But together, these boys from Redding in Northern California were a tight team. And with their mum, Susan, and dad, Ike, this was a loving family. They liked exploring the world, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Melvin did more travel than Bennett. Bennett talked about doing more travel, and I think Melvin probably challenged him somewhat to say, you talk about it, so let's go. And so they did. In February this year, Melvin and Bennett set off on a brother's odyssey around the world. I imagine as parents you viewed uh, this trip like others, a great adventure for them. Oh, yeah. You didn't have any particular fears for them. Um, you know, I did personally have some fears. Um, I'm, 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 like, I'm kind of a warrior, you know, and, <laughs> but the last thing on my mind was it would uh, an, air, an air accident. 
At 8.38 a.m. on March the 10th, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 takes off from Addis Ababa. It's considered one of the world's safest airlines, and on board the brand new Boeing 737 MAX are Melvin and Bennett. But shortly after takeoff, Ethiopian Flight 302 is suddenly out of control. A critical sensor sending information to the plane's new flight control system called MCAS has malfunctioned. MCAS thinks the aircraft is in a stall and literally takes over the controls, pitching the plane into a steep dive. It's almost identical to what happened to Lion Air Flight 610 just five months earlier in Indonesia. But Boeing had since assured pilots further disasters were avoidable, as long as they followed the safety checklist. What Boeing described to us was that simply you go to a known checklist, but what they failed to recognize is that this was a complex, intense emergency, because the airplane's telling you, you're about to stall. So that's happening right after takeoff, within meters of the Earth. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, yeah, that's not good. In this flight simulator, British 737 pilot Chris Brady replicates what's happening in the cockpit. Each time you notice we're getting lower. The Ethiopian pilots would have been trying to follow Boeing's checklist. But what they didn't know was that the MCAS system will repeatedly turn on and off. It means they have only five seconds of control before MCAS overrides the plane, forcing it to nosedive. If you were to time how long it would take me to find runaway stabiliser on this list, and go to it in the book, page 9.9. .9. As you're nosediving, and it's barely enough time for the pilots to consult the Boeing checklist, which can only be found in a paper manual. OK, so that's taken me, what, about two or three seconds? Mm -hmm. So I've only now got two more seconds, potentially, before MCAS comes alive and starts trimming me down. For me, this is all outrageous on so many levels. It is. These are unintended consequences of an ill-thought-out add-on that was necessary. That there would have been calamitous noise on the flight deck. The aircraft was going faster and faster and faster, so there was a clacker going um, to, to tell the crew that they were overspeeding. And it gives you an indication of how overloaded those pilots were. Nothing, even though they tried the checklist, it wasn't working for them. So this is all happening in seconds. It is a sledgehammer to the head, followed by ball-peen hammers to the forehead, and then comes the chainsaw, what we now know as MCAS. And that chainsaw rips through that cockpit, and it's relentless. The pilots were literally in a tug of war with their own aircraft. Yes. The aircraft was just powering at a 40-degree nose-down attitude, which would have been terrifying. Six minutes, they must have realised, oh my God. Yeah, it is horrifying. Yeah, it's unimaginable what, what the flight must have been like. What would the passengers have felt in both those flights? Would they have known pretty quickly that things are, things are not good? It's very sad. It must have been terrifying because of those dives. I'm certain of it. The crash site strewn with personal effects, eyewitnesses gave their version of the final seconds. It went straight into the ground with its nose. It then exploded. I presume you got a phone call. We did. Ike and Susan Riffle were at home that Sunday morning. Susan had just seen a headline about the crash when the call came. And so then when I picked it up and this voice said, is this Susan Riffle? 
And I said, yes. And they said, are you alone? And so I just knew. I just said, both our boys. And he said, I'm really sorry. When you are given news like that, where do you begin to, when you want to try and understand? You know, there's, um, there's no understanding. There, there, so. there is, is still no understanding now, and it's, um, and it's, and and I guess you just don't believe it at first. You know, you think, okay, I'll wake up and this all be over, yeah. and then and the next day and the next day you'll wake up. This is this is not true. How, how could how could something like that happen? For their daughter-in-law, Brittany, the news was devastating. She'd not long returned from the Australian League of the Holiday with her husband, Melvin, coming home to rest up and prepare for the birth of their first child, whom they'd already named Emma. Can you describe um, your life now? My life now? Mm. <laughs> It's taken away from me. <laughs> you know, I, I have Emma and it's just unfair that Emma has to grow up without her father here and you know, he was so excited. <laughs> He was so excited for this next chapter of his life, and so was Bennett. Bennett was so excited to be an uncle. <laughs> and so having that taken from them and taken from us as a family is really hard to deal with on a daily basis. It's obviously going to stay that way for the rest of our lives. For this family, the loss of two brothers, two sons, in the prime of their lives is unimaginable. I feel like our family's just gone. The loss of nobody to pass anything on to, you know, the, the stories, the... There'll be Emma and she'll hear stories from her grandparents for as long as we're around, but that's not the same. All the familyisms, all the things that we, as a family of four, all of that just seems like it's ripped out and it's gone and it's all for naught all the little things like that, that only the boys in us would know. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm acutely aware that these were your only boys. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, um, um, you know, we were, we were lucky. <laughs> I told you I couldn't get to this exactly, but we were we were really lucky that we were a family that all loved each other and all loved each other's company and to be together and to do things together and stuff like that. And it's and and and, uh, and uh, Susan and I were getting you know we're getting we're getting later in life. We're looking at retiring and traveling and and um, um, and. And just watching, you know, watching our boys grow up and grow old, and um, was, you know, you know, they were supposed to bury us, you know. Do you think about the fact that they were together? Yeah, yes. I, do, I do. I kind of wondered if they were sitting together, because you never know. Uh, I'm sure they were. And maybe, but I wondered about that whether they were actually together at that moment. And I kind of wish they were, but then I kind of don't really want to know if they weren't, you know, kind of a thing. I mean, I'm not gonna ever. The, the last six minutes of their life is something that haunts me though. It's that, what they had to go through, what yeah. them and everybody on that plane had to go through for six minutes. The last six minutes of their life is, had to be horrific. It's um, just, um, that, that'll haunt me for the rest of my life. Coming up. This got through. 
What else has got through? How to spin an air disaster. Our commitment to safety is unwavering. And Boeing's response. We do regret the impact that this has had to passengers. Infuriates a grieving dad. Who are you angry at? That's next on 60 Minutes. Boeing's embattled CEO, Dennis Muhlenberg, is standing by his plane. All right, thank you. And I uh, appreciate you joining us here this morning. Hello, everyone. The company's cash cow, the 737 MAX. That's despite the damning evidence of a fatal software flaw in its flight control system called MCAS. Again, our commitment to safety is unwavering, and uh, we do regret the impact that this has had to passengers. But it all sounds like PR to Ike and Susan Riffle, who lost their only sons, Melvin and Bennett, in the Ethiopian Airlines crash just two months ago. I feel like if I was to talk to Boeing, I would say I feel cheated, that I don't, you know, I don't get to see our son be a father, our other son be an uncle, a software malfunction, memories, you know, that I feel cheated. I'm very angry. I mean, I've, I'm uh, very angry. Ike is a former private pilot, so understands the damning revelations about the aircraft. Who are you angry at? I'm, I'm, I, I am angry at Boeing for not addressing the problem to, to find out what really happened. You know, I guess, you know, the 737 MAX was a, was a huge seller for, for Boeing. And um, they had a lot of orders. They had a lot of planes flying. Um, and I don't think that they wanted to take those off a line at the time. And, um, and it's pretty obvious right now that they should have. I think this is going to be one of the biggest cases against Boeing ever in their history. Mark Lindquist is a former U.S. District Attorney. Now he's set to take Boeing to court on behalf of the families of victims in the Indonesian and Ethiopian crashes. There's almost no question here about the legal liability of Boeing. Uh, Boeing is at fault. Their plane crashed twice. The real question here is more one of moral culpability. And the difference is with legal liability, you're just saying, OK, we're legally responsible. With moral culpability, you're saying, we did something wrong, we own it, and we're going to try to make it right. Central to determining Boeing's culpability will be the company's failure to inform its airline customers and pilots of the flight control system called MCAS that could take control of the plane. Most aircraft safety systems rely on two or more sensors. So the fact that MCAS was able to be triggered by a single sensor is almost unheard of. It is absolutely basic in aviation design that no critical system should depend on one thing failing. Yet Boeing did just that, according to Seattle aviation journalist Dominic Gates. And nobody saw the potential of what could happen if it failed or some aspect of it failed. Correct. And that seems like a terrible failing. How can a system on an airplane take over the plane and, and, and not allow the pilot to actually fly the plane. If, like if, if, if you have a system that's going to move the nose of the plane from stalling, why is it not going to move the nose up when it's flying into the ground? I think Boeing now must be asking itself, did we really do that? Did we really design such a fragile system that accidents like this could result from it. Did we really do that? Experts around the world are shocked by Boeing's decision, including David Learmount in London. I think they must be in a state of disbelief because they didn't abide by a lot of the rules they've always abided by before. 
Former Boeing engineer Peter Lemmy in Seattle agrees. For the general public, it is mind-blowing that one faulty sensor could bring down a plane. But that's what happened. That, that was the trigger, that was the catalyst for the whole process, yes. It just took one faulty sensor. Right. The Boeing whistleblower, who's working with the FBI, confirmed that making the MCAS flight control system reliant on only one sensor was a deliberate decision to avoid the need for expensive Level D or flight simulator training. MCAS was designed using data from only one of the sensors because we knew the FAA would not have certified a two-sensor system without Level D training. And for those pilots who were expected to fly the MAX, even more disbelief. I've been doing this for over three decades. I've never heard of a system that is so dramatic, has such a dramatic effect on the aircraft to be dependent on one sensor. Unacceptable. You're taking control away from the pilots and letting a software engineer that's never flown a plane probably in his life <laughs> um, make, make the decisions of the plane. You know, the ultimate sensor on a plane should be the pilot. It's now been revealed that while Boeing was claiming their 737 MAX was safe, pilots around the world had reported over 200 sensor malfunctions. This got through, you know, about 350 people died as a result of this. What else has got through? You know, what else could be, could be on board that we haven't seen yet? Coming up, the plane question. Boeing is saying it's fixed the problem and that the 737 MAX will be back in the skies. Would you ever fly on the 737 MAX? I can understand passengers thinking, I don't think I ever want to get on that plane again. Absolutely. And nor do we until we're confident that it's good to go. That's next on 60 Minutes. The impact of two crashes of the brand new 737 MAX has sent shockwaves through the aviation industry and shone a light on the world's largest aircraft manufacturer. Boeing is in serious damage control. It's contending with falling profits, an ongoing criminal investigation, and increasing questions about its relationship with America's aviation watchdog, the FAA. The Federal Aviation Administration is the regulator the rest of the world trusts to sign off on the safety of all Boeing aircraft. Now the global airline industry is asking how did the FAA miss the software flaws when it's supposed to certify the 737 MAX. It feels like we've been betrayed by Boeing and the FAA, you know. Nowadays, for two of the latest model of jet airplanes to crash, two in a period of less than half a year. What did they do wrong? Many have said that the relationship between the FAA and Boeing is just too cosy. Oh, it's utterly too cosy. Um, the oversight of the FAA simply wasn't good enough. It was certified essentially by Boeing. This scandal has revealed that for years, the FAA has allowed Boeing to largely certify its own aircraft. And in particular, the 737 MAX rushed into service to regain sales lost to its biggest competitor, Airbus. The FAA guys were under pressure from their managers to sign off quickly. They weren't given time to evaluate properly. But where was that pressure coming from? It was coming from managers within the FAA because the whole impetus is don't stand in the way of industry. We cannot have Boeing being slowed down in its uh, pursuit of its com competition with Airbus. Within the aviation world, there's now a sense of unease at how Boeing did business. International agencies, including Australia's Civil Aviation Safety Authority, 
will now be part of a team examining whether the 737 MAX should be allowed to fly again. There are a lot of passengers who are afraid of the MAX. Have you considered resigning? At a shareholders meeting last week, Boeing CEO Dennis Muhlenberg was still defending the company. We're going to be working very closely with our airline customers and with the FAA and with regulatory authorities around the world as we finish up the certification process. Boeing is saying it's fixed the problem and that the 737 MAX will be back in the skies. But of course, there's a whole flying public whose confidence has been severely shaken. So perhaps the true test of whether or not the problem has been fixed will be based on how many people are prepared to step on board. And you can understand passengers thinking, I don't think I ever want to get on that plane again. Absolutely. And nor do we until we're confident that it's good to go. We are with our passengers. It's just that simple. It's that elementary. I want it fixed. I don't want another uh, family to go through this, yeah. ever. It's, it's already taken 300 and some lives, you know, and all those people had mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles in there. And I don't want to see people going through what we've gone through. And if somehow this can, you know, make positive change in the industry and make it safer, we'll, we'll be happy for that. Whatever Boeing does, the fact remains that 346 lives were lost. For grieving families and industry experts, it's going to take a long time to understand how this could have happened. There isn't any other way of describing this than a failure of design. <sighs> Do I care what the motivation is? It's, it's, you know, Boeing is such a great company. Why did they do this? We asked Boeing to be interviewed for this story, but they declined. The company also refused our request to film at its 737 production facility in Seattle. Here, Virgin Airlines is the only Australian carrier with plans to fly the 737 MAX 8 aircraft. A few days ago, it announced it was deferring delivery of this model, saying it won't introduce any new aircraft to its fleet unless it's completely satisfied with its safety. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.